But hey, we're going we're gonna to look at Exodus chapter 4, and we're going to look at the first 12 verses of Exodus chapter 4. So we're not going to do the whole book of Exodus, or not the whole chapter of Exodus 4 today. I originally had planned to, and then I realized that that was just not a great idea. And so we are going to look at just the first 12, or the first 12 verses, and it really helps us think through the way God equips us for ministry, for life, and as we look and consider how Moses was equipped by God for, for his calling. So we've really been kind of marinating. For those of, us who, those of you who have joined us the last few weeks, you've been online with us, um, we've been kind of marinating in the story of Moses and how God has been preparing him, both before he even knew it, and um, how God calls him, and then now how God begins to equip him and send him out. So we've kind of been really looking on the front end of the Exodus story and how God is raising up Moses to, to, reach, to reach his people, to rescue his people, and to save them. So we're going to be looking today at how God is an equipping God and a God who equips us for our calls. And I'll tell you one thing that's got my family excited. Since, since March 15th of last year, or should I say March 13th even of last year, we have been doing virtual school at our house. Our kids have not gone back to in-person learning. Um, and so they've been, we've been doing virtual learning. And our kids are doing fine. They're, they're good kids. They're resilient kids. But starting in a couple of weeks, we've opted for our family. Not everybody's family is choosing this. But we opted for our family to send them back. And so, um, so there is some praise and rejoicing and excitement in our house because we love our kids very much. But, oh man, it's going to be good. And so we are excited about what God is doing in the sending of our children. Uh, but I, but I, this will be Hannah's first time going to school. First time getting on a school bus. First time going to kindergarten class. Now, you know, Pam has been the PTA president forever. And we've been serving in that school for the last six years. So Hannah knows every teacher and knows her way around the building. She's, she's friends with everybody. So we're not concerned about that. But I do think about the first day of school for our kids. Now, now, thankfully, in our, in our family, that our, our, my wife, I, I'm a wing it person. Like, I just kind of make it up as I go. I like to think on my feet, and I like, and that's just the way I prefer to live life, a little bit more on the edge of prepared. And uh, Pam is the opposite. She blesses our family because she is prepared for everything. And the reason why I can wing most days is because I have Pam in my life. And so as, as our kids went to school, the first days of school, as our kids left the house, particularly our, our first, you know, our Kaylin and then Jackson later, as our kids left the school, we made sure, and by we, I mean Pam, made sure the kids were very well equipped for their first day of school. They had their new school shoes, they had their nice new backpacks, they had all the school supply list and some, like, you know, there's like this, the minimum requirement, then there's the like, the if you might need this list. She had all the stuff and all the things. And so they, they had a lunch that would at least serve three or four kids in her classroom, encouraging notes inside there. They had, we had put a picture of our family in the backpack in case there's some tears and loneliness. And so like our, we put our kids on the bus prepared. When Kaylin went to middle school, we made sure she had a binder. We made sure on her phone we had put down Life360 so we could track her everywhere she went. We made sure that, you know, she was basically low-jacked and bugged so we could know what she was doing. We made her practice opening lockers, study the school map. So, like, when we put the kids on the bus, when we sent our kids out for school, we wanted to make sure that they were equipped and prepared for whatever we could think of on, their, on that day. We made sure our kids were prepared. We didn't just kind of like kick them on the bus, say, good luck, hope you find some shoes on the way there. We're going to Starbucks for a, for a date. Like we made sure that they were prepared. Have you ever had an experience like this in your life where you started something new, you've headed out to something, a new season of life, a new job, something where you're, you're, you were new at it and it was a big challenge or task or something and, and you may, maybe you felt really well prepared, really well equipped, or maybe you didn't feel equipped at all. Maybe you were filled with fears and wondering, how, how am I going to do this? Am I able to do this? Uh, do I have what it takes? What do I need in my life? And, and here's why I bring this up. The more we are equipped, the better it helps us face fears for what's next. Is that fair to say? 
Like, the more you know you are prepared, the more you know you are equipped, that you are resourced, the more, you have, the more support you have, the better off you are heading out on whatever's next for your life. And this is true, by the way, especially true for the mission God gives us in our lives. That is, God sends us out into the world, into our neighborhoods, to our families, to our friends, as God propels us on mission and gives us the command to make disciples of all nations, God is not like a bad parent just kind of kicking us out there and hoping for the best. God sends us equipped and prepared and resourced and supported by him. God is a God who equips us for his mission. And so I, we will face fears. Like, let's be honest. As you head out on God's mission for your life, you know, do I have what it takes to live for Jesus is the question that we ask. Do, can I share my faith and lead someone to Christ? Can, can I serve in this ministry at church? What does it mean to love my neighbors? How do I re- disciple my family? These are all fears that we have as we think about living for Christ and going on his mission. But God prepares us. God equips us and God sends us out. And so the big idea I want you to kind of get, get our heads around today is that we can find boldness on God's mission through God's equipping. That we can be bold on God's mission Because God is equipping God. God is a God who equips us for his mission. So whatever task, whatever role, whatever discipleship function, whatever mission and discipleship and following him, whatever your life looks like with Jesus, you can be bold on that because God has given you the things you need to go forward. So here we are in Exodus, and God sends out Moses, not just kind of like, See you later, Moses. Good luck. I'll be in heaven if you need me. You know, I'll check in in a couple years. Hopefully the Israelites are being good for you. That's not how God sends Moses. Instead, he sends Moses fully equipped, fully supported, and with the providence and sovereignty of God behind him and working. Moses was an instrument for God, fully equipped to be on the mission God has for us. And so you and I, we're we're looking at Moses' mission specifically, but you and I have a mission as well. And we need to know how God equips us for our calling in our lives. And so let's, let's dive in. And the, I want to kind of just bring up two big points today about how God equips us on his mission. If we can find boldness in how God equips us, how does he do that? And so from Moses' story, we're going to look at our story as well. So let me pray one more time, and then let's dive into this story of Moses. God, thank you for this morning, and, and remind us today that whatever we face, you are a supporting God, you are with us, your sovereignty is, it, we can lean into, we can trust you. Lord, you, you encourage us, you support us, you give us your spirit. God, you are a, an equipping God that cares for us and sends us out, not without the resources we need to succeed, Lord, but with your, yourself, through your spirit. And so God, give us the strength we need for the mission you call us to. Lord, as you call us to love our families and lead our families well, remind us that we are equipped to be the servants you've called us to be. As we look to love our neighbors and serve our neighbors, Lord, we are equipped through the power and love of Jesus Christ and his spirit in our lives. As we share the gospel, God, give us the strength that we need, the words to say that are beyond our prepared plans or whatever it might be. Just give us a testimony that can help show others that Christ is Lord. And so, God, help us to see today, as we look at Moses' dramatic equipping, help us to see the way that you equip us as well today. And send us out with boldness as we serve you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So how does God equip us on his mission? How does God get us ready for school to send us out? How does God send us out? The the first thing I want you to see from this passage is that God equips us by building our faith through obedience and his assurance. Now I know that's kind of long-winded for a sermon point, but, but God equips us by building up our faith and trust in him through small acts of obedience from our part and, and reassurances that God is true to his word on his part. And what we see in Moses' story here in a couple minutes as we jump into the passage, what you see is this really interesting recipe of small acts of obedience on Moses' part and, and signs of God's power from God himself. And this, this mixture of Moses taking a step of faith and God 
affirming his power through, through these signs. So as, as God calls Moses, he gives him some signs that he's there, all's going to be good. So let's start in Hebrews, uh, Hebrews. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Here's what it says. Moses answered God, What if they don't believe me and will not obey me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you? So Moses is asking a question of God here in this passage. Now I know we're, we're picking right up where we left off last week, so I'd encourage you, if you're confused at where we're at, jump back and read Exodus chapter 3. But what happened was, is Moses was out tending his flocks, his sheep, and God shows up in a burning bush. And he tells Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt, and you are going to free the Israelites from their bondage of slavery. You're going to bring them out of Egypt, and you're going to lead them to this mountain to worship. So Moses, I've got a mission for you. Go back to Egypt. I know you've been gone for 40 years. They, you, know, you, you killed somebody, so you had to flee. But I'm sending you back, and you're going to free the Israelites. You're going to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh, after some, some stuff, is going to let you go, and you're going to come back to this mountain to worship. And so Moses, as God tells him this, Moses has been going through a series of questions about like, kind of who am I that you would call me to do this? Who are you? Like, how do I know who you are? And so actually Moses asks God five questions as he goes through this calling. And, and they go from like kind of honest questions to ridiculous questions. Like there are more objections and excuses at this point. But, but what we see here, the question that Moses has is, is what if? What if they don't believe me? You're sending me back to Israel what if they don't believe me? What if they don't think you sent me? What if, what if things go wrong? What if nobody wants to listen to me? It's a fair question. What, 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 what if? Now, now, God has already said that they're going to listen to you, but Moses is still questioning. And so God is gracious, and he gives Moses these faith-building signs that God is with him. So look at verse 2. Moses asks, what if? And the Lord says this, The Lord asked him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. Throw it on the ground, he said. And so Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. And the Lord told Moses, Stretch out your hand and grab it by the tail. And so he stretched out his hand, and he caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. And this will take place, he commanded, or he continued, so that they will believe that the Lord, the God of your, their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. So Moses is questioning, God, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't think you showed up? What if they don't trust me? What do I do? And God says, look at your hand. That shepherd's staff you're holding, throw it on the ground. Moses obediently throws it on the ground, probably thinking to himself, uh, okay. And then it turns into a snake, and he runs away from it. Now Moses, just, just to put things in perspective, I don't think that Moses has a fear of snakes. Moses is a shepherd, shepherder, which means that he is used to like keeping snakes away. Like he's, He knows how to handle snakes. Snakes is a regular occurrence. So my guess is this is a nasty, this is one of those snakes that you just don't mess with, you move on from. You know, in our house, like we'll occasionally get... I know some of you who don't like snakes may never come visit us now, but we will occasionally in the back of our house get some little cute little foot-long garden snakes and they'll kind of like slither through the yard or end up in the garden. And so uh, we, we will occasionally get those snakes and they're, they're not dangerous. Like they're cute. They're, they're not, I mean, I don't want to keep it for a pet, but, we, but we, like, when, it, when those come in our yard, sometimes I'll trap it and I'll throw it in a bucket or something. I'm like, hey kids, come check out the snake we just caught. And we'll kind of either relocate it or permanently relocate it someplace. But that's not the kind of snake that's being talked about here. This is a snake that makes a professional shepherd a run. And maybe part of it was just a surprise that his staff turned into a snake. But he runs away. And I think it's, I think it's interesting because the number one rule of snakes, if you've ever messed with snakes, like what's the number one rule? Don't pick it up by the tail, right? Right? 
Like everybody that's ever messed with snakes knows you don't grab it by the tail because they can turn right around and bite your arm. They don't like their tails being grabbed. I've learned this the hard way as a kid by grabbing a snake by the tail. You don't grab snakes by the tail. But what does God ask Moses to do? God asked Moses to grab that, stretch out your hand. The guy that's just run away from the snake, stretch out your hand, grab the snake by the tail. And so Moses stretched out his hand, caught the snake by the tail, and it instantly turned back into his staff. And what you see here is that God calls Moses into that that small step of obedience, that small step of conquering his fear that would eventually lead to to bigger acts of conquering his fear. Like this, this little act of faithfulness linked with the sign of God is building something into Moses that will be used for the bigger acts of faithfulness. And so let me throw this here on the screen. Small acts of obedience will build toward big acts of obedience. Moses didn't, God, God's not saying in the moment, you know, go back and tell Pharaoh, let people go. Like, Moses is not there yet. He's going to be there. But in the moment, it's just grab that snake by the tail. Trust me to protect you and provide for you in this small thing so that you will trust me in the big things to come. And he grabs that snake by the tail. Small acts of obedience build toward larger acts of obedience. Faith builds, it's like a muscle in many ways, that the more we exercise our faith, the more we get stronger in our faith. Small acts lead toward big, big acts. And you see that here in the story of Moses. Now one cool thing, and I, I want to be careful not getting too distracted by the history so we never finish the sermon, but many of the commentaries I read this week, many of the historians believe that this snake was actually a cobra snake, which is a nasty snake, right? I don't mess with cobra snakes. Garden snakes, one thing. Cobra snakes run away. And the reason why it was a cobra snake, many people think, is because in, in, in Egyptian worship and Pharaoh worship, one of the signs of Pharaoh's power was a snake. There, Pharaoh himself, you probably have seen this in pictures of history, that Pharaoh would wear a headdress or a head outfit that would have a cobra's head on it. Kind of like would sit over him. And it was a sign of power and authority. And, you know, I'm in charge because I'm a snake. I'm mean and tough because I'm the snake. And so a snake became the symbol of Pharaoh's authority and rule. And what God does is he takes that symbol of authority and basically says, I'm in charge of it all. You think a snake is the most dangerous thing? A cobra is the most dangerous thing? Look at this. Staff. It's a staff again. And so God is clearly saying, I am in charge and I have authority over Pharaoh. I have power over Pharaoh. And I love that picture. God is pointing to his authority in that sign. Now, now look, at, look as things continue. I, lo- I love this, how, how the passage continues. Verse 6. In addition, basically, in case that's not enough, in addition, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. And so he obediently put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, His hand was diseased, resembling snow. Put your hand back inside your cloak, he said. And so he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, the skin had again become like the rest of his skin. So here's kind of a weird one. Like, I'm not sure Moses, what he's thinking at this point. But God tells Moses, put your hand basically inside your cloak, inside your coat. He puts it in, kind of like a hat trick, if you will. He pulls it out. And all of a sudden, it's leprous. You know, we, leprosy has basically been eliminated from our world today, but back in the times of the Bible, for, for almost the entire biblical storyline, leprosy has been this destructive disease that causes your skin to decay, causes your nerve system to decay, and basically gets to the point where your skin can't feel itself. It gets white. It, once, it, once it starts to turn white, it starts falling off. Like arms, fingers, body parts, they just start falling off. It's... It's really a great, great disease. And we'd be thankful that, that we can wear a mask and keep COVID away. But like the leprosy is, was, was the deadly kind of, will make your body fall apart. And so when Moses put his hand in there, he pulled it out. All of a sudden, he's like late stage, stage four leprosy. His hand looks like snow. It's like the next step is falling off. And then God says again, put it right back in. 
and he pulls it in. Now, there's some obedience here, right? What's, I'm putting my hand in my cloak. The last time I did something, it became a cobra. I'm going to put my hand in my coat and kind of feel what's going on here. Pulls it out, and then he puts it back in and pulls it out for healing. So again, there's, there's obedience going on. That God is showing, God is showing that he can, he can just trust God. That God is going to reveal himself. But here's another cool thing. Again, something, something I learned in the history of this. The Egyptian nation had invested big bucks into trying to solve leprosy. Like they, they had invested all of their scholarly research and, and some of their healers and their whatever they had. They had thrown all kinds of money at trying to figure out how to rid the, the world of, of leprosy. And they were kind of like the world power at the time. So they had the best doctors, the best healers, the best magicians, the best everything. And so they were, they were actively trying to stop leprosy and fix leprosy. And they kept not, ha- kept not happening. Of course, we know even in Jesus' day, centuries and centuries later, leprosy is still a thing. And so they had thrown all of their resources, so much of their resources, into curing this disease to show their power and might. And here with Moses, he's like, watch this. Leprosy, gone. God is showing himself to be the true and final healer. God is revealing himself to have power and healing that is beyond what humankind can do. God is revealing himself as the true healer. Only God can cure the incurable. And this is a spiritual picture and a physical picture as well. That God can heal and God can restore brokenness that so many people have written off, God can heal. Now let me keep going because this is, I'll we'll never get through this passage today. Verse 8. Third sign. If they will not believe you and will not respond to the evidence of the first sign, they may believe the evidence of the second sign. And if they don't believe even these two signs or listen to what you have to say, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. And so uh, this is kind of a weird one, but, and, but it, he does not actually do this here. But God says, look, take some water from the Nile, scoop it up, kind of walk back, and then dump the water on the ground. And once you've dumped the water, it will turn into blood. Now notice the sequence here. This sequence has a trust in it. That when Moses scoops it up, that's not when it transforms. It doesn't transform into blood just kind of holding there. Hey, look at this. Look what I've done. It transforms after you pour it out. After the trust that God's going to show up and change that water into blood. That the sign is going to be true. So there's a level of trust and obedience, right? That, that Moses pours the cup, but he trusts that God's going to show up. I mean, how embarrassing would it be if you're like, watch this, guys, and you pour out the water and it's like, they're like, wow, you poured a cup. Great job. Like, congratulations, my feet are wet. But instead, there's a sense of trust that, that God will show up as I step out in obedience. And so I hope you see here, the key thing I want you to see here is there's this, this unique recipe uh, in this mix of trusting and obeying God and God showing up to reveal himself. That as Moses takes the step of obedience, he throws his staff down, he grabs his staff, he puts his hand in his coat, he pours out the water. All of these signs of God require steps of obedience in Moses' life. They require a trust that Moses will step out and trust God, obey God, follow God, and in the, in the mix of it all, God shows up. And I, I believe this is how God works in our lives today too. Faith is a muscle that we exercise. And the more we step out in faith, it's amazing the more our faith will be built up. The more we, we step into trust, the more we will see God and trust him more. It's like the more we step into faith, the more God reveals who he is. And so yes, this is, this is unique for Moses. This, like None of you have shepherd staffs that you're like, check this out, guys. Like that's, that's, not, that's not how God is revealing himself right now. That's not how God chooses to work. But the same God that that shows up to Moses is the same God working in your life and my life. The same God that calls us to obedience is the same God that was working with Moses and working with us. And so the same principles are here too. As we step out in faith, as we lean into trust, we will begin to see the work of God. 
The same God that gives these signs to Moses gives us work today. Maybe it's dramatic. Maybe it's not quite as dramatic as a, as a staff turning to a cobra, but I, I've seen God work in dramatic ways where God has provided in ways that I never could have, could have imagined, that God uniquely provided. I've seen God protect in ways that are dramatic and, and beyond how, you know, you, you see people in car wrecks that their whole car is totaled except for, and like they walk away without a scratch and you're like, oh, that was God work. I mean, it must have been God. It's like he just, the car just kind of wrapped right around them. I've seen God protect. I've seen God connect people together in a way that only God can do. And so, yes, I believe that God can extraordinarily reveal himself and show himself and provide and protect and all these things. But I also believe in the everyday ordinary of life. God shows up. Maybe you're just, you just barely make it through the work week and you hit the couch on a Friday night and you just lay there and you, you reflect on God's grace to get you through another day. That's God revealing himself. Maybe, maybe you have strength to get through another day, strength to, to stay in a hard place where God reassures you in the ordinary. God is, is working all around us. And let me throw this on the screen because the more we notice God at work, the more we see God at work around us, the more we will find confidence for God's work for us. Like the more you see God at work in your life, in your family's life, in the world around you, the more you open your eyes and you lean into trust and God reveals himself, the more confidence you will have. The more, the more you step out in faith, the more faith you have. It's something that builds. And so God is giving Moses signs, but he's building something into Moses too. He's building a faith. He's building an obedience. This reminds me in many ways of Luke chapter 16, verse 10, as Jesus Jesus is teaching and he tells us this, that whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. And whoever is unrighteous in very little is also unrighteous in much. Meaning that the, if we're faithful in the small things, it leads us to a faithfulness in the big things. So God is building obedience and faithfulness through his reassurance into Moses. God is equipping Moses right now with this. He's not sending him. He's equipping him with faith, and he's equipping him with signs. Now here's the second point, and I'll, I'll, I'll move through this pretty quickly. God also equips us because he extends our capacities through his own ability. In other words, God gives us abilities. God gives us strength. God gives us resources. God gives us opportunities beyond our capabilities. Now this is so important to remember that God will often call you above and beyond what you're comfortable with. That God will call you on a mission beyond what you think you can do. And in fact, I think if you go, oh man, I can do that, then, you're too, then your, your goal for God's in your life is too small. But God gives us strength, power, and helps us beyond what we feel like we can do. I, I love this next excuse from Moses. And that's all this is right now, it's an excuse. Verse, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 10. But Moses replied to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either, either in the past or recently, or since you've been speaking to your servant, because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. And the Lord said to him, Who placed a mouth on humans? Who makes a person mute or deaf, or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord, now go, I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. So Moses, Moses this is, by the way, his fourth, his fourth excuse, his fourth question, is, Lord, I, I can't speak. I, I, I'm not eloquent. I don't have good words. I stutter. My mouth is sluggish. Like, you hear me speaking right now. I'm, I'm not very good at speaking. And now a lot of people have kind of wondered, what does this mean? Does this mean that Moses maybe had a speech impediment? Does this mean that Moses had some kind of physical disability? I'm not sure I buy that totally because as you look throughout the book of Exodus, Moses is speaking all the time and there's no, there's no other indication of, of this speech issue. My gut, as I look, and we don't know this because this is just me making assumptions as I look at the text. My assumption, my, my gut is that this is a culturally, this is a polite way to decline. Like, you know when you kind of like have this over sense of humility because you don't want to do something? Like, um, oh, that's so nice of you asking me. I'm sure you can find somebody better. 
I'm sure you can, oh, thank you for all, oh, you, you want me to lead a Bible study? Oh, I, I'm sure there's somebody who knows more. Um, it's kind of a humi- humble way of saying, go ask somebody else, right? I don't want to do that. And so I think that's what's going on here. Moses is using, maybe he's got something with this, maybe he's not been a public speaker, but I think this is more about Moses saying no than it is saying I can't speak well. But God ignores it and teaches a point beyond that, right? God doesn't even like, God doesn't go, no, you're not. He actually, he tells him, look, I made your mouth. I made words. I made people with, with disabilities or without disabilities. Like, I'm in charge. I made, I made you the way I made you. I made you like a little hot dog, the, the unicorn stuffed animal round, whatever that stuffed thing was. I made you the way I made you. Go do what I asked you to do. I will help you. And that's the key there. Now go, verse 12, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. God gives us gifts. God made us. God knows our strengths. He knows our limitations. God knows us. And God sends us beyond our capabilities so that we can learn dependency on him. I mean, does God, if Moses was like, sure, God, I took rhetoric in school. Like, I got this. Let's bring it on. You know, yeah, that's great. But, but God gets more glory when Moses is like, I can't do that. And God's like, I will do it through you. I will, I will work through you. God loves to leave us scratching our heads going, wow, God showed up in a big way because I couldn't have done that on my own. God loves to show his glory by working beyond our abilities and beyond our capacities. Now, this happens in lots of different ways. Maybe God uses you, even though you think you can't be used. Maybe God gives you answers when somebody asks you about your faith that are beyond you, like the Holy Spirit just gives you the answers or gives you, gives you the right words to say. Maybe God gives you endurance on a hard task. Maybe God provides when we're lacking. But the point is, we can depend on God. Moses is still looking at himself. I can't do this. I can't think this way. I can't speak well. And God's like, you don't need to. Depend on me. I will equip you. I will send you. I will give you the words to speak. It's about me anyways. Be dependent on me. And this gives God's glory and helps us know his grace. Reminds me of this verse, which honestly, I don't think we live this way enough. John chapter 15, verse 5. Here's what Jesus himself says. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. But notice this, because you can do nothing without me. So I don't care if Moses was the best speech arguer, the best debater, had all the best words, knew all the best things to say. It doesn't matter because God tells us without me, you can do nothing. So God equips us beyond our ability, beyond what we think we can do. God gives us strength in that moment. And right now, God is doing that in your life. Maybe there's some things that you're ready to give up on. Maybe there's some some tasks God's called you to, a ministry in this church or in your home, that you're like, I don't know if I can do it anymore. I don't know if 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 I'm strong enough or if I'm smart enough or if I have this enough. God is equipping you so that you can depend on him. We're not wired to be able to do it all. We have to lean on him. We're not wired to do everything in our strength. We have to lean on him. So we have to learn this dependency on God. And this is especially true for our salvation. We're not saved because of what we can do. We're saved by what he has done. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, to pay the price for our salvation. We've all kind of walked away from God in our own ways. The Bible calls that sin, but we've all fallen short of God's plan. And there's nothing we can do to restore ourselves to God because we can't. We're unable to. God is perfectly holy and we are not. We can't make ourselves perfectly holy. But God in his love sent Jesus Christ his son to live the perfect sinless life, to die on the cross for our sins. He was buried. Then on the third day he rose again and he calls us to, to believe in him, to turn from our sins and follow after him with our lives. And in that decision to believe in Jesus and follow after him, he restores to us, he gives us Christ's righteousness, something that we can't do on our own, and we can, we can find salvation and live for him every single day. God equips us with that gift, but it's not about us, it's about his work. And so let me encourage you, you are equipped. God is the good parent. God is more like Pam. 
uh, where he's sending you with everything you need. He's sending you with all the things you need, whatever mission God has for you to do. God is sending you out with everything equipping. God sent Moses equipped. God will send you equipped because he's with you. So if you're going through suffering right now, you can have his strength. If you're facing disappointments in life, you can, you can lean into his hope. If you're facing challenges on mission, he goes with you. If there are needs you're trying to meet, he will supply all your needs. And so God equips. Now next week, we're going to look at the very last excuse Moses gives. And just to give you, just to give you a hint, verse 13, Moses says this. Here's his final excuse. Lord, send someone else. And God sends help. And so next week, we're going to dive into how God sends help in our weakness. And so let me pray and send you guys on your way. Hopefully the ice is all gone. You'll have safe drives home. But let's, let's look to the Lord this morning. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. And I pray that you will help us to realize how equipped we are. That you've um, you sent Jesus. You've sent us your spirit. Lord, that you equip us for your ministry. And so God, in our doubts, in our wondering if we're called or if we can do this or if we can continue going forward, God, remind us that you have equipped us that you build our faith through small acts of obedience, God. Show us and reveal yourself around us to be working. And God, remind us that it's not about us to begin with, it's about you. Teach us to depend on Jesus Christ. He is the vine, we are the branches. And apart from him, nothing happens. So God, remind us of that today. Help us to know your salvation. And thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.